Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon uh, to who is with us at the International Environment House. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is uh, with us on WebEx or is now watching the video of the event. We have the pleasure to welcome you today for a side event to the Regional Forum on Sustainable Development for the UN Economic um, uh, Commission for Europe Region. The forum is taking place uh, today and tomorrow in Geneva and virtually. This side event, uh, which will discuss uh, microplastics uh, pollution, was initially proposed by the University uh, of Geneva and is co-organized uh, with the Geneva Environment Network, Norway and Switzerland within the framework of the Geneva Bit Plastic Pollution uh, Dialogues. The Geneva Bit Plastic Pollution Dialogues have kept the international community in Geneva and beyond engaged on this topic since the end of uh, 2020 making links with the United Nations Environment Assembly and other international processes. And again today, we are making these links. The dialogues uh, which third series is being launched with this event are organized by the Geneva Environment Network in collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, IUCN, Norway, Switzerland, and the Forum on Trade, Environment and Sustainable Development Goals, known as TESS. And our new partner is from today, the University of uh, Geneva. I will have the pleasure to moderate uh, this event and introduce the speakers when giving them the floor. Before we go into depth on the topic we are addressing today, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary, as well as the video of the event will be made available on the webpage of this event. The link is being shared uh, in the chat. Throughout the event, those who are online can raise their questions by using the Q&A box uh, or making comments on social networks. We will use your questions to feed the discussion um, after the presentations. And we will, of course, give uh, the floor uh, in, uh, to who is in the room. The aim of today's event uh, is to provide an overview of the current global state of science and policy uh, of marine pollution by microplastics and possible impacts on life below water. The event will discuss the nexus of science, policy and action to achieve target one on reducing marine pollution of the Sustainable Development Goal 14 on life below water, one of the goals being reviewed by the forum this year. Um, as you most certainly have noticed, uh, microplastic pollution is making headlines in the media. In the past uh, few weeks, articles in well-known media, media have uh, been relaying that it's uh, snowing microplastic in the ocean and that microplastics have been found in human blood uh, for the first time. As we relaunch uh, the dialogues, uh, this topic seems uh, timely. For the opening of this event, to provide us uh, the international and political context of the event, how history was made some weeks ago, the relevance of various international processes in this context, and what we are trying to achieve, it is our pleasure to give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Franz Perez, Switzerland's Ambassador for the Environment, who was leading Switzerland's delegation at the United Nations Environment uh, Assembly last month, and whose team is also involved in the regional uh, forum. Excellency, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. And let me thank you so much and the University of Geneva and the GEN for organizing such a timely event at the margins of the regional forum on sustainable development currently taking place in Geneva. As you know, the Regional Forum Europe is a great opportunity for our region to contribute to the, substantively to the high-level political forum on sustainable development, the HLPF, notably through an exchange of knowledge, good practices and solutions to support the implementation of Agenda 2030. This year, SDG 14, Life Below Water, is under in-depth review and we trust that this event will also make useful contribution in that regard. Microplastics, as you just have indicated, are an important issue to address to reach target 14.1, addressing marine pollution. A month ago, at UNIA 5.2, a highly important decision was taken in this regard. The international community agreed to launch negotiations on an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution, including the marine environment. This global treaty will certainly make a significant contribution to the implementations of the SDGs and namely also SDG 14. Let me now first highlight some of the key points um, of the resolution that I believe are really important uh, for our discussion. 
First, the recognition that we need to address plastic pollution in all the compartment of the environment. Focusing on marine pollution alone is not sufficient, as most plastic entering the oceans are from land-based sources. Second, the mandate is clear about the need to address the full life cycle of plastics. It means that there is broad understanding that to prevent and reduce plastic pollutions, we need to adopt a comprehensive approach that not only focuses on downstream measures such as waste management and marine pollution, but also takes ac action upstream. Indeed, as we are not and will not be able to future recycle all plastics, it is really important that we reduce plastic pollution as such. We need to find ways to reduce the amount of plastic entering the markets. We also need to build a safe and sustainable circle of plastic economy, meaning that the most problematic plastics need to be phased out. Third, the resolution mentions explicitly that microplastics are part of plastic pollution. While this might seem obvious for some, it was not the given, and in fact, that is in front and center. It was not the given, and in fact, that is it is front and center. It will allow policymakers to fully consider this. This element also is also another proof that plastic pollution is a concern for all countries. Microplastics are everywhere, and clearly, landlocked countries like mine, my own, we are also not immune to this phenomenon. And as also just published in recent articles, microplastics has also not only been found as snowing in the oceans, but also uh, they have also been found in the mountains, in the rivers, and in the lakes, like in Switzerland, where we'll mention the La Clema later today. This resolution adopted at UNIA is also clear on the fact that we will need to use the best available science to guide our actions and that there will be a need for scientific assessments. No later than last week, a widely shared Guardian article reported about the study that found that 80% of the persons that were tested had microplastics in their blood. This is also another strong indication that we have to act on plastics and that we have to act on plastics in all its compartments and throughout the life cycles, not only focusing on marine pollution. It is clear the impact of microplastics in environment and on human health still needs to be further analyzed. The same, goes for, the same goes for ways and means to address the issues and the wide, avoid leakages of microplastics. But this brings me to the, important, uh, to the importance of strengthening the science policy nexus. During initial conversation among negotiators, it was clear that we need more data and science, notably on microplastics. Indeed, it will certainly be a horizontal issue during the plastic pollution treaty negotiations, as it is most likely an issue of concern in all the stages of the plastic throughout its life cycle. It is also no surprise that the Nordic Council will deal with this issue for its fifth report to be published after the end of this year. I am sure we will hear more on this issue from our Norwegian colleagues today. Links between microplastics and chemicals will also need to further research, and during the panel we will hear more on that from the BRS Secretary. The need to strengthen the science policy nexus is one again, but is again very important. I am therefore particularly pleased that today we will hear from Professor Vera Stavekoya on her current research on microplastics. Her work will certainly support our negotiation going forward, and it is a great example of putting theory into practice. Let me now conclude by looking at the synergies that Geneva can offer uh, and the competence that Geneva can offer on this topic. By saying that we, that we are impressed that has happened so far and that all the expertise that we are here in Geneva, we also say that it is great to continue to support the process in Geneva. It is great also to see the engagement from academic institutions to support the policy work and we are convinced that this will be very, very much needed also in the further negotiations of the treaty. It is really a privilege to kickstart the third series of the Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues with such distinguished speakers. 
This multi-stakeholder approach will allow us to learn from different perspectives and allow us to force the synergies. And fir I firmly believe that it that it's through these kind of partnerships and collection collective works that through this we will build a strong coalition to really address plastic pollution. This year we have a number of key milestones along the way to advance our work. The current regional forum on sustainable development, Stockholm Plus 50, the BRS COP, the Ocean Conference. Our colleagues from Portugal will give us, will give us more informal later, and the HLPF, to just name a few. But there are also some key steps this year with regard to, to the new plastic treaty that has to be negotiated. So we will have end of maybe early June, a first open working group that comes together in Dakar to plan the further negotiation process of the legally binding instrument plastic. And already this year, we will probably have the first negotiation committee meeting to address uh, and to negotiate a new treaty. These new treaty negotiations will be critical to successfully develop a framework that really will make a difference on the ground. Therefore, we'll have to work hard together to bring, uh, to, to develop a robust treaty that is effective and efficient and that really will contain the measures needed to address plastic pollution through all the life cycle plastics. And that will also be critical to uh, help us to achieve the objective of uh, SDG 14.1. Therefore, we have to do everything possible to support these negotiations and Geneva, once again, with all its expertise, will be a critical place to do so. We stand ready to, our, to do our part, notably through experience that we have here in Geneva. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention. And most importantly, thank again the University of Geneva and Chen for launching that uh, pollution, beat plastic pollution dialogue series again, and to provide like that also a first input to the HLPF later this year. Back to you, Diana. Thank you very much. Um... Excellency, uh, for providing the context for our event today. Moving on uh, with the program, as you mentioned, uh, Professor Vera Slaka Slavekova from the University of Geneva will now provide a scientific perspective on life below water and microplastic pollution. Uh, Vera Slavekova is a professor in environmental uh, uh, biogeochemistry and ecotoxicology at the Department uh, for Environmental and Aquatic Sciences at the Institute for Environmental Science. Um, of the University of Geneva and is also the president of the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Vera, you will update us uh, on the scientific advancements concerning the possible effects and risks by microplastics to the aquatic life and biodiversity based on your current research on microplastics, but also on the global scientific community advancement on this uh, topic. And Professor, you will also speak on the major sources of microplastics uh, and their relative contribution to the global uh, microplastic budget. You will provide us uh, uh, with your latest data on human health implications also. We will also be happy to hear uh, how the work you and the scientific community is doing can be used uh, in political instances and thus can support the negotiations going forward, as it was mentioned by uh, His Excellency Ambassador Perez. The, uh, Professor, over to you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really delighted uh, to be here and very grateful um, to, to be able to share with you, you know, the uh, latest uh, scientific uh, advances uh, and provide to you my environmental chemistry and ecotoxicology uh, perspective uh, concerning uh, the issues of macroplastic uh, pollution. Um, so, look uh, around uh, you. The microplastic and plastic objects are everywhere. Next slide, please. And uh, we cannot imagine our life without uh, plastics. Um, and uh, of course, we have uh, exponential growing production and use of the plastics object. And uh, con concomitantly, we have an increase of the plastic uh, objects in our environment, starting from the waste and microscopic objects going towards uh, nano uh, plastics. With all this, there is a rising concerns about the environmental implications of um, plastic waste in general and micro and nanoplastics specifically. And five trillions of 
this huge number represents the microplastic species that we estimate to have currently in the ocean. And where this object can come, first we have what we call the primary microplastics that uh, really found and intentionally produced in different uh, um, everyday um, uh, products, for example, uh, toothpaste, uh, creams, and other. They have also a huge um, use in different kinds of industry as we use them as uh, noodles. Um, another very big, more than 35% contributor to the global pollution by microplastics is with uh, microfibers, which are washed out uh, by the clothes that we, we wear. And, you know, maybe you are aware, maybe not, but every time when we wash uh, an item, uh, we, we know that there is about uh, 1,900, you know, fibers in a micro-sized uh, range that goes out. And then we have a very big group of uh, uh, what we call the secondary microplastics that is produced by uh, the fragmentation of the big uh, objects from plastic waste um, through the different kinds of processes like a UV light, uh, the waves of the um, ocean and aquatic uh, uh, systems, also um, through different uh, uh, biological processes. And, uh, Talking about the secondary microplastic, we can see that this intimate uh, link between the microplastic pollution and the macroplastic uh, waste. Uh, next slide, please. And indeed, we know that rivers that are um, uh, mm, carrying the plastic waste uh, are contributing to more than 90% of the plastic that goes to the ocean. And the top 10, you can see here on the slide, and top one, you know, it's a Yanze uh, River. Next slide, please. So where are these uh, microplastics found? Uh, we know they can be found in the deepest part of the ocean, on the top of the mountains, uh, also in the Arctic uh, ice or Antarctic ice, uh, etc. But here you can see them. Uh, they are so globally distributed. But what's very important from my perspective is to know if we have hotspots where the concentration of the microplastic is high. And here on these maps showing the distribution of the microplastics with different sizes range is, you can see that we have a two kinds of hotspots. One uh, kind is uh, coastal areas, and the second one are ocean, ocean gears. So we know the microplastics are everywhere. Now the big question is, is there any and what is the possible impact to the life? Next slide, please. So, uh, what we know, first, we know actually that the microplastic are taken up by biota in general and marine biota. So, they are ingested by different organisms such as uh, uh, zooplankton species, uh, such as uh, filter feeders. Why? Because the microplastic has a similar size as a phytoplankton, which is the food for all these organisms. Of course, one part of the microplastics will be excreted, but not all. So, next, please. So, uh, we know that ingested microplastic can be uh, transported through the uh, aquatic food webs. And not only this, we have a data that they show that microplastic can contaminate different tissues and organs, one accumulated in the organisms. And here you have an example with the fish uh, that we found that uh, the microplastics are really distributed in, in the gut, in the liver, and also in the gills of the fish. Um, next, please. Um, so, talking about the effects. So, there is this accumulation, but it's very important to know if 
we have some consequences, some toxicity of this object towards aquatic organisms. And in the literature, we can find a plethora of possible effects. You can find here some examples, including physical uh, effects, uh, reproduction effects, oxidative stress, etc. And this uh, uh, observation were, were found uh, for different organisms, starting from algae that are at the bottom of the food webs, so going, you know, to the fish, also morus, etc. And we can um, say, we know two main groups of effect currently. Please, next. So, first is the physical effects related with the microparticle size. Uh, could be an inhibition of the food assimilation, decrease of the nutritional value of the food, etc. But more importantly, we worry about the chemical effects of microplastics because we know now that they can act as a platforms for chemical cocktails. And we know that there is uh, different additives uh, that can be released under some conditions that uh, due to their small size and high reactivity, the microplastics can absorb different uh, hydrophobic contaminants found in the aquatic environment, as well as toxic metals, as well as a pathogen. So there is a big uncertainty with the information that we have available uh, currently. And uh, we know that uh, we have a very complex toxicological profile we observed with the microplastics. But please keep always in mind when we talk about the effect that the doses make, uh, you know, the poison. So all is question of concentrations. Please, next. Um, next slide, please. So I just choose to give you one example and to show you, you know, it's a really a, a, a good example of, of the chemical effects a lot of substances can be leached, you know, from the microplastics. And here the colleagues from Switzerland compared the, uh, the, the composition of the uh, uh, leaching uh, from different kinds of materials, which was very, very rich uh, in different kinds of substances, including uh, metals, uh, plasticizer, um, uh, etc. And they were um, uh, uh, toxic for example, even to the organisms at the bottom of the food web that we usually do not consider very affected by the microplastics. And uh, please, when we have a discussion, next, next, please, um, we should keep in mind that when we talk about the, the microplastic and plastic in general, we are using about 10,000 substances to produce them. They can have different roles. And, um, a very recent study has shown that maybe 2,400 from these substances could be of concern. Um, next, please. Now, we know we have plastics in the environment. We know they can induce a risk. But as I mentioned, all is question also of concentration. So we currently have no tools that allow us to, you know, to, to do a, may, uh, how to say, the direct measurements direct comparison, but what we can do is the probabilistic risk assessment of the effects. And you can see the results that were done uh, for marine system in which we can see and compare the concentration and their distribution uh, that are measured in the uh, our um, marine environment with the concentration of the plastic that there is no uh, effect um, induced uh, to biota. And this distribution are very well distinct. That means that under the current situation, we can say that the risk is unlikely. But in the hotspots, in particular, we have uh, uh, this overlap in the distribution. That means the risk is not to be excluded. Um, there is a big uncertainty, and we should work in this direction more. Why? Because when we compare the sets of data available about the uh, exposure and data set about um, uh, toxicity um, uh, uh, results, we can see that we have a big difference in the materials that are found in the environment with respect to what were tested for in the toxicity and test. And the same uh, concerning the size and the shapes. And uh, also, a big issue currently is that we do not have data about the microplastic concentrations with the size below 300 microns. Next slide, please. Now, um, uh, what about 
transfer of the microplastics from seafood to humans. Um, very recent study has estimated that um, annually, um, by, by consuming different seafood, we can be um, ingesting about uh, 55,000 particles. Of course, you can see here over the, uh, the globe, the distribution, it is not the same uh, everywhere. In some countries like European, uh, for example, region or China, Australia, North America, we have higher concentration. That depends on our, you know, um, uh, food habits, etc. Please. Um, so we are exposed to microplastic, and this is one of the exposure uh, roads. Please, next slide. Uh, and the major question that we ask, and we have not yet answered, is do uh, microplastic can have an effect to the human health? As was already mentioned, we know that you can find them in the ex uh, excretion, uh, babies and, and humans and adults. Um, but very, very recently, maybe two weeks ago, we have uh, this paper that was published, uh, as was mentioned um, by Ambassador uh, Peretz, that in 80% of the uh, donors, uh, the high concentration of the uh, plastic uh, microparticles was found. And it, it's interesting to see that more than 50% contained the, the polyethylene terephthalate, uh, 30 were polystyrene, and then the other they were um, um, <laughs> uh, polyethylene. Uh, so for me, this is not means, yeah, that it could, um, I mean, have some effect, but it's a clear suggestion that the microplastic can pass, you know, the biological barrier and can travel around the body. So we really should, should keep going and studying deeper. Next slide, please. Thank you. Huh. Now, the question of microplastic, Particle microplastic pollution is not just uh, you know a question and, and problem of our ocean. It is all a problem of the terrestrial ecosystem. And I want to give you you know an example with with um, Lake Geneva. <laughs> we are here in, in Geneva, the shore of the lake. Um, uh, Geneva Lake, uh, maybe uh, just to, uh, to mention, is one of the most studied lake in the in the world. So it was also one of the first lake in the world that the estimation of the number of the microplastics was made. And you can see here the number in the the Great Lake. Uh, we had about uh, 220,000 of uh, of microparticles per square kilometers. Next, please. And um, what we also found by laboratory research in uh, in my group uh, was that this material uh, can be, uh, for example, ingested by different biota. You can see here the example of uh, water flare Daphna magna. Uh, we have an ingestion that depends on the size of the particles. Of course, it is uh, dose dependence. And if we do, you know, the ecotoxicity estimation with this uh, um, uh, species, uh, we we can evaluate that depending on the size, the material that we have tested, and it is polystyrene, could be either toxic or harmful according to, to European hazard classification. Next, please. Now, uh, what we can do, I mean, as a scientist, as a, um, people working at the university, to support all the efforts, uh, you know, um, here for, from, so, um, the, uh, the, 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 it's, it's what's logical. I mean, uh, with, with this uh, uh, sustainable development goal number 14, we must reduce the plastic pollution. Um, of course, we cannot uh, remove, I mean, the microplastic from our oceans with the currently existing technology. So, I mean, from my perspective, and I'm talking environmental uh, chemistry and ecotoxicology, what we need is to produce, I mean, the best possible science that will help to reduce the existing uncertainty. So that we have a low uncertainty when we ask a question if there is any risk or not to the aquatic environment. And of course, to do so, I've seen that we need to develop the methodology that allow to go sample and measure with the bigger precision and as low as possible sizes of this material, and then use them for monitoring and in the future, use them for monitor the future, you know, uh, um, treated of the global level, and also developing concepts and models that also can be used to assess the possible risk and impacts. Um, 
And of course, I think it's very important is to, from our side, to contribute to the education and to raise the awareness about the plastic uh, pollution and in particularly the invisible uh, plastic pollution, which is the micro microplastics and nanoplastics. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, taking stock of what you have presented, we will continue the discussion with the scientific needs of policy and governance. Uh, we have three uh, new speakers who will help us uh, unpacking uh, the, the how uh, uh, can this knowledge support global policy and governance, including uh, the UN Ocean uh, Conference, a new instrument on plastic pollution that has been uh, mentioned, achieving SDG 14 uh, uh, and the chemicals uh, conventions uh, agenda. We'll discuss also how the existing instruments and multilateral environmental agreements are currently helping to address uh, microplastic uh, pollution. Our first panelist uh, in this part of the program is Heidi Savelli Soderberg. Heidi is with us uh, from Nairobi, where she coordinates um, uh, the UN Environment Program's marine litter, and, uh, marine litter activities within the framework of the Global Partnership on Marine Litter, which is hosted by the Global Program of Action uh, for the Protection of the Marine uh, Environment from Land-Based Activities. Heidi is also an ecotoxicologist um, and her work in the past years has been instrumental in supporting uh, the United Nations Environment Assembly resolutions to address the issue of uh, plastic uh, pollution. Heidi, you are bringing here uh, the United Nations Environment Program context, and among the topics you will be covering, uh, there is the uh, United Nations Environment, uh, Environment Assembly uh, resolution, or should I say resolutions, that uh, His Excellency Franz Perez referred to and how microplastics are addressed uh, in the resolution. You will also speak about uh, microplastics in the pollution to solution report that uh, UNEP has recently released. Another relevant work on microplastics ongoing in the context uh, of UNEP. And if you have time, you might also have a few words on how UNEP is contributing to the high level political forum um, process on uh, SDG 14. With that, uh, Heidi, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you again for inviting um, me to be part of this discussion and panel. And uh, as you mentioned already, there has been, of course, a lot of work that's happened over the year. And I think the previous speakers provided an excellent overview of the issues that particularly surround microplastics. If we look at the discussion around the um, latest resolution, there's, of course, reference to product design that's included that it, amongst areas of provisions that the INC or Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee may wish to consider. And here, when we're looking at both the intentionally added microplastics that are added to sometimes cosmetics, but many other types of products, this would be an area that could be relevant for consideration and further discussions. It also speaks to the issue of health, both environmental and human health. These are other areas where especially the issue of nanoplastics, and which is a subcomponent or, or sub part of microplastics, would also be relevant to consider, again, also in the context of abrasion. So microplastics uh, from wear and tear, both smaller particles and down to nano potentially. So these are some areas for the resolution. And as we're going forward with the uh, ad hoc open ended experts group, as the ambassador mentioned, it will be taking place 30th of May until the 1st of June in Dakar, Senegal. And uh, this meeting will particularly focus on rules of procedures, as well as organization of work among some things, and will guide or provide uh, guidance to the first ink would be, which is uh, anticipated to be held later this year. In addition, when we look at the issues around uh, microplastics, UNEP published the From Pollution to Solution report, which was launched in October last year. And this one highlighted the concerns around the monitoring and assessment of microplastics. This was one area. This is, of course, because of the high variability in size, in shape, in color, degree of degradation, and the fact that there are considerable sampling biases um, of different field and laboratory techniques for identifying and determining the volume of microplastics in different compartments, including in biota. And that without significant improvements, 
in quality assurance and control protocols for sampling and analytical techniques, it will still remain difficult to demonstrate the reliability and the repeatability of published results that we're seeing around. So that the, the report highlighted the need of, of trying to address the issue that data and information are being collected, but quite unconnected and fragmented. And that there is a need to streamline both methodologies, data flows, and also indicator sets. Are we look, measuring the same type of, uh, of um, microplastics, for example, or sizes, or are we using the same language? Are studies comparable across the scientific community? And that there is also a need to facilitate uh, increasingly joint analysis, unified definitions, standards and formats, as well as infrastructure and well-developed ones for data flow storage and sharing of information around microplastics to allow us to consolidate and build a body of knowledge that then policymakers can benefit from. And this includes standardization, harmonization and interoperability of different uh, data sets and platforms. In, when we're looking at the some of the future research priorities that were highlighted in this report, they did look at the establishment of informatics and harmonization and monitoring frameworks, uh, standard methodologies, but also look at the potential toxicology of microplastics and additives in different compartments, including in the environment, to be able to measure the effectiveness and impacts of different interventions and mitigation efforts. And also, when we're looking at microplastics, the, the difference in brain the range of sizes and also different types of microplastics makes it a more complex issue to try and manage because there will be different management approaches depending on the type of microplastics that one is trying to address if it's microfibers micro nanoplastics or others like secondary microplastics i think um the professor spoke before me excellent presentation and covered everything around the more detailed uh, considerations around microplastics. I would not go into this, but I build on what she said because she highlighted um, the need for more risk kind of based approaches and considerations of risk when we are looking at management. The report highlights the need for risk frameworks. So looking at both the systematic and holistic risk framework that to assess the risks that the different microplastics and also plastic pollution posed to ecosystems and biodiversity economies as well as human health and society. And here there, there is an opportunity and we are working with the GESAMP group, for example, the joint group of experts on scientific aspects of marine environmental protection that have initiated considerations around the microplastics and the risk framework as well. And I think when we speak about risk, we don't always think about the risk the finance risk that is also part of the problem and that when in particular with microplastics could there be liability related aspects around microplastics in the future these are things that insurance companies maybe wish to consider as well um, as they look ahead about on, on unwrapping the risk that plastic pollution can mean to both themselves the insurance industries but also potentially to investors where we're looking at especially intentionally added microplastics. So these are some of the, the things I wanted to highlight and I'll hand back to Diana. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Heidi. And moving on the agenda on this um, topic on how um, can the scientific knowledge support global policy and governance, it's now my pleasure to turn to Nuno Lacasta president of the Portuguese Environment uh, Agency, who is with us uh, from uh, Lisbon. Um, it's now the first time, uh, it's not the first time you speak at one of our events. Uh, you, are, you are a lawyer who previously worked for the Center for International Environmental Law, who is uh, one of the partners of these uh, dialogues. Nuno Lacasta, you will bring us the context of the UN Ocean Conference that Portugal is co-hosting with Kenya this year and also other processes where Portugal is involved, including, uh, um, we should mention here that uh, Portugal is sharing uh, uh, not only the group of friends uh, on ending plastic pollution uh, in Nairobi, but also uh, is the current chair, actually, of the United Nations Environment Program Committee of Permanent Representatives. Nurul Akashta, over to you. Well, 
Well, hello everyone. Thanks very much for the invitation. And indeed, I'm, I'm very much sorry not being able to be in Geneva with you because, as you mentioned, uh, I worked for CL for for a couple of years way back when, and I lived in Geneva, so I miss I miss Geneva for sure. And I bet it's getting really pretty this time of the year. Um, so once again, thanks for for the invite. And uh, after a couple of pandemic-related postponements, uh, I'm happy to recall everybody that the much-awaited second United Nations Oceans Conference will finally take place in Lisbon uh, from the 27th of June through the 1st of July this year. Uh, and so today I'm providing uh, an update on, on the conference. I think it's uh, relevant for, for our dis discussions today. So first, on the preparatory process for the conference. And it includes negotiation on a political declaration to be adopted by consensus. Uh, one which uh, a declaration which is concise, action-oriented, focusing on solutions based on science and innovation to support the implementation of the SDG 14 that is, has been much mentioned today. The co-facilitators, Grenada and Denmark, presented a draft in February, and uh, this declaration is currently under negotiation at the UN in New York. Um, Issues that uh, for sure will uh, emerge as part of the declaration includes uh, include topics such as solutions or decisions uh, based on science as mentioned, climate, ocean nexus, the blue economy, the complete water cycle, bad pollution from plastic waste and marine litter, of course, um, and crucially the uh, issue of uh, negotiations on the international uh, treaty mentioned uh, earlier, I think it's a very relevant initiative going forward, uh, but also initiatives related to the establishment of good management of marine protected areas. These are some of the topics, of course, which, as you know, are being uh, uh, considered. Uh, moving on to the preparation of the eight, uh, of the eight in interactive dialogues uh, as part of the conference, they will address topics that were decided at the pre preparatory meeting held in February 2020 and were based on a proposal presented by the Secretary General of the United Nations and in line with SDG 14 targets. Um, the UN Under Secretary General uh, Liu Zemin, as you know, was appointed as Conference Secretary General and has invited member states to submit comments for the concept papers for uh, these uh, interactive dialogues. Um, these uh, papers sure should be finalized by the end of the month of April. Um, also, after a call for member states to express the interest of their government's high-level representatives to serve as co-chairs, the selection process for such co-chairs is now underway, two for each dialogue, along the selection uh, of moderators, one per dialogue, and of course members of the panels, four per each dialogue. So this is important that we have a diverse uh, uh, makeup for these panels that is composed both of uh, uh, political representatives and uh, officials and, of course, experts. Um, some of the topics which will be part of, of uh, these dialogues uh, uh, include managing, protecting, conserving and restoring marine and coastal ecosystems, minimizing and addressing ocean, ocean acidification, um, making fisheries sustainable, uh, promoting and strengthening sustainable ocean-based economies, um, in particular for small island developing and least developed countries, and increasing sci scientific knowledge and developing research capacity, managing microplastics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is very important because as part of the uh, uh, the dialogue on addressing marine pollution, we all know that there is now widespread consensus, as we've heard that the ocean cannot absorb the current number of uh, uh, human waste. And the problem of marine litter is not a myth, as we all know, and everybody needs to be involved. Uh, both countries producing the uh, vast amounts which we just heard, and of course, those that happen to be uh, the destination for such litter. Uh, in the case of Portugal, as you may know, we have a very extensive uh, economic, ex exclusive economic zone, which stretches far out into the mid-Atlantic, and this is, of course, as you may imagine, a considerable challenge. Another topic I would like to address, of course, is that the event will also have a high-level segment from the 27th, on the 27th of June, 
as well as a plenary, uh, several plenary sessions dedicated to statements by the heads of delegation, including heads of state and government. Um, the conference will involve all stakeholders relevant to the implementation of SDG 14, bringing together governments, the UN system, intergovernmental organizations, international financial institutions, and other international organizations, NGOs, and civil society organizations, but also academia, the scientific community, the private sector, philanthropic organizations, and other actors. And this is a very diverse makeup, which we all must take advantage of and profit from their inputs in order to, to move forward on, on, on looking at how to protect uh, our oceans. Um, the conference priorities are, of course, to achieve tangible results by the involvement of all these stakeholders, and particularly the, the private and uh, 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 the, the, the public sector, but also the financial sectors. Um, mobiliza mobilizing youth is also very important and crucially uh, uh, looking for the coordination and cooperation between the various international initiatives in the area of the sea, which, as you well know, are, are increasingly work working together uh, such as back in 2017, the first conference on on, uh, on the ocean, um, the, the, now the UN Decade on Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, the World Ocean Assessment 2, published last year, the conferences Our Ocean, the next will be taking place in Palau uh, this year, and uh, the One Ocean Summit, among others. Um, another note I'd like to make very quickly is that the UN Secretary General sent letters of invitation for the conference for all heads of state and government, encouraging countries to participate at the highest political level. This is important, of course, because there is the expectation that the conference, the, the Ocean Conference, will become a landmark event in terms of sustainable development uh, for this year. Uh, and it will feed onto processes and onto uh, also uh, high level discussions, both at the COP15 Biodiversity Convention and COP27 uh, Climate Change Conventions. Uh, this is important that we need have these different processes uh, communicating with one another. Um, it should also be noted that the Conference Secretary General uh, sent a letter as well to member states and international donors, as well as to the private sector, financial institutions and other potential donors, encouraging voluntary contributions to a trust fund to support the participation of representatives of developed, developing countries. And priority here has been given, of course, to least developed countries and small island developing uh, countries. Uh, Portugal, for instance, has recently contributed 200,000 euros to this trust fund to encourage such participation. But also like to very briefly mention that the program, in addition to the official program, there's a host, a very diverse, uh, um, uh, number of events being organized, uh, um, both at the official and indeed in the so-called blue zone. And these include a high-level symposium on water, um, as I mentioned, to address the water cycle, uh, sustainable blue economy investment forum, United Nations uh, Ocean Conference on Youth and Innovation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, it's important that uh, uh, these events take place, these so-called side events take place, but also other side events are encouraged. And therefore, the uh, uh, enrollment for such side events is already launched. Uh, link online is already available. And please note that uh, the deadline for submission of side events proposals is uh, this week, the 8th of April. So this, uh, uh, with regard to the uh, Oceans Conference, we record, we're of course very excited to, to host it. Uh, uh, later, of course, than we all anticipated, and everything is pretty much on schedule to, to, to have a very meaningful and interesting conference. The final note, uh, as you mentioned, on, uh, on, uh, on a discussion panel that uh, both Portugal and Chile have launched a couple of, about a year back. Um, and it's, as you mentioned, the group of friends on Nairobi to combat marine litter and plastic pollution. Indeed, in July last year, uh, Portugal and Chile launched this uh, uh, this informal group um, with the goal of driving ambitious 
coherent and effective global action against plastic pollution in the lead up to UNA 5.2, including, among others, galvanizing support for the development and consideration of an effective global governance framework to combat marine litter and plastic pollution. I think this is very urgent and it's, uh, it's, it's an area which we are very much committed to, to indeed driving this awareness. And in the face of the uh, landmark adoption of the resolution to end plastic pollution towards an international legally binding instrument by UNEA 5.2, the object objectives of the group have been revised to reflect the developments mentioned and in support of the process that is now starting. Therefore, the group will continue the technical and policy dialogues series in Nairobi and indeed in other relevant and formal activities in a complementary manner and in support to the work to be developed in the framework of the Internet International Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee to continue creating capacities, improve knowledge sharing. The Nairobi Group of Friends is, as I mentioned, an informal, voluntary, non-legally binding, inclusive and open-ended association of all interested members and observer states. And currently we have 39 member states plus the delegation of the European Union, which have officially joined the group. And we continue encouraging member states to officially join the group. And in addition, we also have 22 non-governmental organizations and one international organization as part of the group. Since the group's establishment, we've organized several Nairobi dialogue series uh, that have addressed issues such as trade, plastic pollution and circularity, chemicals and health, legal aspects on a potential uh, uh, international intergovernmental negotiating committee, a global circular, circular economy for plastics with perspectives from the private sector, and more recently, following the adoption of the resolution at UNEA, a meeting of uh, just transition focusing on informal waste sector, whose important role is recognized in the said resolution. So this is in a nutshell what I'd like to address this, this meeting and indeed uh, inviting you all to, to attend the UN this conference, either in presence or online. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, Nicola Casta. Uh, so we expect to have an upcoming session of the Group of Friends in Nairobi also at addressing the issue of microplastics. And regarding the UN Ocean Conference, um, uh, you mentioned a few processes to which it's linked, but there are many other processes ongoing in Geneva um, that are also have also important contributions to make uh, to that uh, conference. We are now moving and bringing the context of the Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, um, one of the existing instruments uh, currently helping to address uh, microplastic uh, pollution. Just uh, decreased uh, well, here with us in the room is a program officer within the Secretariat of the Convention, and he will present the Basel Convention uh, Plastic Waste Amendments and how the, the Basel Convention can help address microplastics across its uh, three uh, uh, pillars. Also to mention that our colleagues uh, uh, is uh, currently ongoing in Nairobi, um, and many of, the, of our colleagues are there. The open and working group of the Basel Convention, uh, with many uh, uh, events ongoing uh, in Kenya. Just you will also refer to the technical guidelines on plastic waste, um, technical assistance, and other tools to reduce uh, releases of microplastics, and also refer to recent developments under the Stockholm Convention to address uh, microplastics uh, pollution. We'll also hear from you uh, on the chemicals and plastic governance project that, project that uh, the Secretariat has recently launched. With that, uh, just over to you. Thank you so much, Diana. And um, I would like to also express my gratitude to be on such a distinguished panel. Um, it's a real pleasure to once again share my insights um, in the Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution uh, Dialogue series. Uh, it's always been very, very exciting discussions, I think, and I hope that uh, some of the thoughts I can provide today uh, might be helpful. And, um, of course, uh, considering recent developments, uh, I hope that they can also be helpful um, as we move forward towards an international legally blind binding instrument on plastic pollution. So with that, um, as already mentioned by Diana, I would like to um, look at how and try to explore with all of you together how the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, in particular the Basel and Stockholm Conventions, can make a contribution and in fact are already making a contribution to address microplastics. Now, normally we talk about plastic waste in that context, but of course 
um, as we have just heard, the two issues are inextricably linked. Um, so a very good example for the science policy interface is how the Basel plastic waste amendments that were adopted in 2019 actually came to be, because no doubt it was the mounting scientific evidence that um, provided the impetus for governments to come together and adopt the Basel Convention plastic waste amendments. Um, so why do the Basel plastic waste amendments matter for microplastics? Um, I think one way to think about it is we can conceptualize it across three pillars, um, which you see now on the screen also. So first, the amendments imply that all plastic waste, including mixtures of plastic waste generated by parties to the convention and which are to be moved to another party, are subject to the prior informed consent procedure unless they are non-hazardous and destined for recycling in an environmentally sound manner and almost free from contamination and other types of waste. So the conditions are quite strict, so to speak, to fall outside of this, uh, this scope. So making the link to microplastics, of course, if we have le more control of transboundary movements, if we have less plastic waste being traded illegally, it also means we will have less plastic waste that is not managed in an environmentally sound manner. We will have less plastic waste that is dumped. And as a consequence, uh, we have heard about secondary microplastics being a very important source. So as a consequence, we will have less fragmentation of, sec of plastic waste into secondary microplastics. So that's the first. Um, of course, before I move to the second uh, pillar, so to speak, um, I would also like to mention when it comes to trade and transboundary movements that, of course, also the Stockholm Convention is extremely important. Um, now, we have already heard uh, in the excellent briefing before regarding the scientific aspects that microplastics, of course, carry hazardous chemicals. And many of these chemicals are, in fact, also classified as persistent organic pollutants and listed under the Stockholm Convention. In fact, half of the chemicals that are listed under the Stockholm Convention approximately are also used as chemical additives in plastics. A very, very interesting case that is very recent and again really underlines the science policy interface that is at the heart of this issue is when in 2012, uh, sorry, 2021, the POPROC, the Persistent Organic Pollutants Review Committee of the Stockholm Convention, decided that UV328, um, which is also used as a high volume additive in various plastic products, satisfies all of the criteria noted in Annex D of the Stockholm Convention, including the potential for long range environmental transport. So essentially it was found that uh, this chemical is being transported with marine debris in long range through the environment. In 2022, the POPROC decided that this chemical is therefore likely as a result of its long-range environmental transport to lead to significant adverse human health and or environmental effects such that global action is warranted. To a lesser extent, but also very relevant, is the Rotterdam Convention because also this applies to trade, though trade in chemicals, not trade in waste, um, but also here the prior informed consent procedure as well as the information exchange mechanisms that apply to, to the, chem, the listed chemicals can be a very helpful tool in addressing chemicals that end up in plastic products and thus eventually also in plastic waste. Turning to the second pillar, um, by which I mean environmentally sound management. The categories, uh, the specified categories in the plastic waste amendments are also subject to the Basel Convention's provision on environmentally sound management. So here again, of course, a similar logic applies in that if we manage plastic waste that is not already primary microplastics in an environmentally sound manner, then of course we can also significantly reduce the amounts of plastic, uh, the amounts of microplastics that end up in the oceans or elsewhere. And of course, under the Basel Convention, we have a lot of guidance and tools for this purpose. So for example, there are the technical guidelines uh, on the environmentally sound management of plastic waste. Uh, which are at the disposal of, uh, of parties to the convention as well as other stakeholders. And these are currently being updated um, and we hope that this process can be completed soon to provide further assistance to parties. And just to briefly also mention that um, I made the link with the Stockholm Convention and indeed also in the second pillar on the environmentally sound management, the Stockholm Convention again is of course very relevant because there's also a lot of waste that is contaminated with POPs 
right? And um, on that occasion, I would also just like to mention the um, project that is currently being implemented by the Secretariat together with the University of Wollongong and um, with the generous financial support of, uh, of Norway, um, which will map the global governance landscape uh, of management of chemicals of concern used in plastic. And it will also outline options how a global plastic agreement could address such chemicals. Turning to the third pillar, um, prevention, prevention and minimization. Um, of course, the specified categories under the plastic waste amendments also pertain to the spe specific provisions on waste prevention and minimization. So in that sense, this is also very relevant. And of course, we can make the argument that if we look at the waste hierarchy, um, could I have the next slide, please? If we look at the waste hierarchy, it becomes very apparent that the most preferable option of addressing any type of waste is always prevention and minimization. Um, this is also noted, in fact, in the strategic framework for the implementation of the Basel Convention, which features the waste hierarchy among its guiding principles. And um, essentially what it says is that if prevention and minimization is not possible, um, the next best option is reuse. And then going further down the hierarchy, um, we come to recycling and then eventually um, recovery operations, including energy recovery, and then finally final disposal as the least preferred option. Now, microplastics present very unique challenges. We have heard that during the initial presentation on the scientific aspects, because we have the primary microplastics, we have the secondary microplastics, then we also need to consider that we have, um, we have the issue of microplastics being in products. We also have the issue of microplastics being generated during processes, for example, during recycling operations, uh, in the textile sector and, and in other, um, other contexts. Nonetheless, or be, perhaps actually because of this, I think the waste hierarchy is even more important because again, it provides the most efficient and the, the most direct way of reducing um, releases to the environment of whatever type of microplastics. Now, this might sound a bit um, abstract so far, so let me provide a few concrete examples of how we are doing this um, in many of our technical assistance and other projects um, supported by generous contributions from our donors, including Norway, Germany, Switzerland, the Norwegian Retailers Environment Fund, Netherlands, and others. So, for example, if you look at prevention and minimization, the first step of the waste hierarchy, uh, we are currently implementing a pilot project in Ghana where we are trying to um, use compostable packaging that is made from seaweed in order to replace water sachets, uh, which normally are made from plastics and which pose a huge pollution issue uh, in Ghana due to their widespread use. Um, another example is the introduction of reusable bags that we are also piloting there and that many, many other stakeholders are piloting across the world. In fact, we were just gifted one of these uh, beautiful bags. Um, then when we move further down, recycling. Um, also here, again, the issue with primary and secondary um, has to be kept in mind. So for example, we have a project where we, um, with our partners, um, collected and then recycled plastic waste fishing nets. So again, these fishing nets, they're often dumped in the ocean and then of course at a certain point they start fragmenting, leading to microplastics. So again, if we can actually collect and recycle them instead, then we will avoid the microplastics being in the ocean. Um, another example, and now this is attacking more the primary microplastics, is that we're working with partners to replace uh, microbeads from being used in cosmetics, for example, or toothpaste. Um, then, as we move further down the hierarchy, let's think, for example, about recycling. Um, there we have a little pilot where we're working with um, the recycling sector to provide training to them uh, because a lot can be done at very low cost to minimize the releases of microplastics from recycling operations, in particular in developing countries. Um, and to mention another example, uh, we are now planning a pilot in Sri Lanka, um, again with the kind support of Norway, um, where, among others, we are planning to work with the textile industry because, as we have heard, it's a major source of microplastics. So, this is just to, to give some very concrete examples of 
the many, many options that we actually have to address microplastics at each of these stages that we have seen from prevention all the way to final disposal. And um, one final word of an intervention that's also very important because I mentioned the three pillars, environmentally sound management, prevention and trade. Regarding trade, of course, we are also providing a lot of technical assistance and trainings, uh, in particular of custom officers, custom authorities, so that they are able to control plastic trade, uh, plastic waste trade efficiently. So to conclude, building on the scientific consensus that we urgently need to address primary and secondary microplastics, as well as the hazardous substances carried by them, and keeping in mind the waste hierarchy, um, my belief is that we need instruments at three levels, preventing microplastics from being generated in the first place, ensuring the environmentally sound management of plastic waste so that we don't have the fragmentation, and controlling transboundary movements of plastic waste, again, to avoid the releases of plastic leading to further degradation. At the same time, we need to address the chemical dimension, such as by phasing out the use of certain hazardous chemicals. And in different ways and in a complementary manner, I believe that all three conventions, the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions, can make very important contributions in addressing microplastics across these dimensions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, just um, for this presentation that has completed this part on, on what's happening uh, on the global policy level with some of the ongoing processes. We have now time for some questions, and I'm looking first at the room for who is physically with us at the International Environment House before I turn to who is uh, online. So for who is online, don't hesitate to use uh, the chat box or the Q&A box. Looking at the room, are there any questions uh, regarding uh, what Vera has presented, uh, uh, showing uh, what the science is telling us about the need to, to act on these um, microplastics and, 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 and what uh, the policy makers have been sharing with us with some of the processes ongoing. I have here a question in the room. Please go ahead and, and introduce yourself when you take the floor and don't, yeah, open the mic. Thank you, Diana. I'm Alexander Herjazi, University of Geneva. Uh, very wanted to uh, to thank you very much for uh, for a very comprehensive uh, uh, layout of the, uh, the the landscape when it comes to uh, microplastic pollution. Uh, this event is taking place in Geneva in, on the sidelines of uh, the regional forum on sustainability and the forum's uh, mayor uh, mayor's um, forum of mayors. And one of the the elements that have been discussed extensively during those few last days is data. Uh, obviously, we would we need, in terms of uh, all sorts of pollutions, contextualize uh, different sorts of pollution, including microplastic. The question I have for you, uh, Vera, is what kind of data are available at this point, and how far can we contextualize in terms of refining or disaggregating existing data to be able to come up with sound policies? Maybe before giving you the floor, just checking if there are any other questions to complement. I see, Franz, that you have put on your camera. Do you want to add something or should Vera first answer? The complexity of uh, hybrid events. Exactly. No, I just wanted to, to, to turn off the camera to show I'm here, but uh, I'm only if that question. I don't have to say something for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Franz. So, Vera, uh, a first question for you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so, um, I would say we have quite a lot <laughs> and quite some data. Um, a lot of, of work and advancement was done, was done in the last maybe, I would say, 15 years, both on, uh, let's say, assessment of the concentration of the uh, microplastic in uh, the environment and also um, uh, the impact and effect of different biota. Um, so that's a nice set, but as I mentioned, it's uh, how to say, um, somehow when we look at the data that are available about the concentrations, uh, they are with some limitations. <laughs> then when we look at the data that are concerning the impact, also they are not very consistent with what we found in the environment. And the, 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 the reason for this is the, the really the lack of tools that allow us to go and really measure in our environment the materials that are in the range below 300 micrometers, 
that's one of the point and uh, that's very important because the material with the lower size is considered to be more reactive than material with bigger size and consequently we could expect you know that the interactions are more important and and consequently uh, also the uh, effects so i would say there is quite a lot there is a frames I mean, like, uh, for example, this probabilistic risk assessment that's uh, currently available. There is a discussion, and I, I like very much that we are going in this direction, is to consider the biogeochemical cycles at the global level concerning, you know, how to say, the flow of all this material in all the environmental compartments. I mean, as we do, by the way, for <laughs> different kinds of contaminants, which are covered uh, either by Minamata Convention on Stockholm, uh, etc. So we are on a good way, but we need to go further. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Vera. I don't see a hand. Oh, yes, there is a hand here. There are two hands in the room. So uh, please introduce yourself when taking the floor. Mike, there on the right. Yes, thank you. That'll do. Um, hello, I'm Nicholas Harden Mountford. I'm Head of Oceans and Natural Resources at the Commonwealth Secretariat. It's a real pleasure to be here and, and to have a, 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 a just such an excellent summary of, of the work that's been going on on microplastics and, and its relevance to the new convention. Um, I was fascinated by hearing about the, the, the work in Ghana. I, th I think, you know, there's a number of these stories coming up using seaweed. We've got a session at UNCTAD this afternoon on, on seaweed and value chains. And, um, but um, one of so the question I have about that is what evidence is there that, that these plastic alternatives are displacing plastics in the market rather than just supplementing it? And what policies should we be putting in place to encourage that displacement? Just go ahead, yeah. Thank you very much. An excellent question, because it's exactly the kind of question that we try to answer with this pilot. Um, so what we are trying to, to explore, in fact, is um, so the introduction of the um, compostable uh, seaweed packaging um, will be accompanied by a number of surveys that we, that we um, will implement throughout the pilot. Um, both with the um, the vendors that are actually going to use this packaging as well as with the customers who are then uh, going to buy the products that are packaged in this way uh, so as to find out if there's actually a take up um, from both the customers as well as the vendors because of course we need the both sides to be to be fully on board so to speak um, what we've seen so far is that there is a small but not negligible competitive disadvantage for these compostable seaweed packaging compared to traditional um, thin plastic that they use, for example, for the water sachets uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we have already been discussing on this and one of the most obvious, you know, answering the second part of your question, one of the most obvious ways this could be addressed is, uh, for example, through a tax um, that would apply to plastic packaging. Um, in fact, um, some countries have taking steps either already implemented or are taking steps towards such taxes on on plastic products so by raising the thus the prices of plastic products the alternatives may become uh, more competitive uh, over time uh, so this is our hope and indeed we we hope to learn more about these things and just a final note um, to make sure that that because when we talk about you know these alternatives it's very very important to be careful because as we all know there is a number of um, alternatives that are deemed or labeled biodegradable, but in fact uh, are only biodegradable under circumstances such as above 60 degrees in industrial composters, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and they often contaminate the waste stream, recycling becomes more difficult, et cetera. So these kind of alternatives, we need to, to, to be very, very cautious and, and really have the evidence, again, science policy, first have the evidence before moving forward with such a, for example, oxo degradable uh, is a good example of where not to steer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Just. There was another question there, Yves Lador. Yeah, thank you, Yves Lador from Earth Justice. Uh, as the, the issue is uh, between uh, the nexus between science and, and policy, um, we are a bit at a turning point right now. 
considering the, uh, the the fact that we have also the other resolution that was adopted in UNEA on having a, a, a global policy uh, interface, uh, science and policy interface uh, on the question of uh, chemicals and, and, and pollution. And um, I was wondering in this period uh, where we are going forward, how does this uh, precisely dialogue will will continue between the scientific bodies? You have a number of scientific bodies within the, the BRS conventions. Uh, they're also with, uh, with Minamata. In a way, they're very expertise approach in the sense that they're very focused. And what we hear also from your presentation, uh, Professor Slavekova, sorry about my very poor pronunciation, um, the, uh, that the, you have some kind of a general you have some kind of wider issues than just the expertise, which is mobilized by the different uh, legal bodies, which are focusing on very specific elements. This is precisely the advantage of what we hope to see is coming this new, uh, this new instruments. But this new instrument will not be there during the negotiation of the, uh, the instruments, uh, the other legally binding instruments on, on plastic. And so I was wondering, how do you see these two elements of this question goes to the uh, scientific bodies as well as to the political bodies. Uh, how you see this articulation during this process of the negotiation, should as I, the two are going to be developed in parallel. Should I start by giving the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Franz Perez? Also because there was another remark uh, in the chat, uh, Franz, uh, on the science and policy uh, uh, and the resolution that was recently adopted uh, at, uh, at the UN Environmental Assembly. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Diana, and also thanks to you for, for this question. I think that's a pertinent question. As you said, uh, this uh, SPP, this science policy panel that will uh, be developed now and established, will not replace the very specific scientific institutions uh, within the conventions. These uh, scientific bodies within the convention have very specific uh, mandates, for example, to look whether certain substances will meet the criteria of, uh, of the Rotterdam Convention or whether they meet the criteria of the Stockholm Convention. So they have very specific mandates and they will, of course, continue to, to have to deliver that work. The SVP, the Science Policy Panel that will be established now, will have other functions. First of all, an horizon scanning, so uh, helping us to, uh, to detect early whether, uh, if you look at the scientific literature, whether you look uh, at science, whether there is something, whether there is an issue, a topic, that is not yet on our radar, but that should be on our radar uh, and that will require policy development. So this will be one of the tasks and the other, of course, also to look at very specific um, questions uh, that are asked or posed to him. Uh, so in future, this um, panel could be certainly also supportive for uh, the work as we are doing it now to negotiate a new legally binding uh, instrument on, on plastics. <coughs> Sorry, but however, <coughs> but however, um, the work of this panel will, will not be able, the panel will not be able to deliver its results within uh, three months, for example. So uh, despite that, we will still need uh, to have the possibility that, for example, UNED is developing very specific analysis of very specific questions that have to be uh, solved in order to develop the legally binding instrument. If you look at the mandate uh, that was adopted in Nairobi, there are several elements uh, that we should be addressed by, by, the, uh, by the legally binding instrument. And in order to find out what are the right and the best tools to address these elements, be it product, product design, be it sustainable production or consumption, or, or be it a waste management or, 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 or life cycle approaches, there UNEP probably will have to undertake very specific studies to support the negotiations. In short, this new science policy panel will not replace neither the very specific mandates of the bodies on, established on the conventions, nor will it be able to deliver the, the very specific input that will be needed for ongoing negotiations like the one on, on, on the plastic agreement. But it will certainly be helpful uh, in order to be uh, in future earlier ready to detect new emerging issues. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Franz, for this uh, complete answer. Um, looking here, looking online and looking also at the time, um, because yeah, we only have a few minutes left and we also have some closing remarks to hear. I think I can now turn over to all the members of the panel and I will start with Vera. For uh, um, if you had a message you would like us to, to bring back from this mess home, from this event, Vera, what would be in 30 seconds, one minute, what you would like us to take over? 
Okay, I will try to be short at this time. <laughs> um, so what I would say, uh, the ocean is essential uh, for, for component of the Earth ecosystem, and it is life supporting. Uh, human, we depend uh, on the ocean for you know many of our needs. So it's it's a critical um, for sustainable development of our plant. So. Um, I mean, when we, for example, pollute our oceans with uh, microplastics, plastics, or any other uh, substances, um, from my perspective, that, that means that we make them ill, we make them sick. So, what would be the, my, my, my message? All of us, I mean, science, policy, governments, citizens, etc., what we need to do is really to, to put all the efforts together and, uh, you know, uh, find the uh, um, best possible uh, solution to treat the causes and not just the symptoms that we usually have this, you know, um, way of, of thinking. So, find a way to treat the causes and not just the symptoms. That's my, my final message. Thank you, Vera. Moving to Heidi, who has to chair another meeting. Heidi, if you are not chairing the other meeting, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And um, what the... Um... Some considerations at the end here, I think, is that we, the complexity again that we are looking at. Are these things also what is the definition? There is still not a good enough definition of what microplastics are. Are microplastics also considered, are they solids or are they not solids? There could also be considerations around class based approaches as well. And also defining what could be, if we look at essential use around the intentionally added microplastics or primary ones, then you could consider also and what is unnecessary, avoidable and problematic and how would a prior informed consent in a way be operate in the context of intentionally added. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi. Moving to uh, Nuno Lakasha in Lisbon. Well, first of all, it was a very uh, informative um, debate here and briefing and I think the two key takeouts are number one that we need informed and science-based policy making we have lessons from other regimes that that was indeed the case and they were successful as a result uh, secondly we have now a public awareness window if, as it were that we must not waste going forward because publics are indeed demanding from uh, uh, authorities that we address issues of plastic pollution, particularly also microplastics. So I hope the Lisbon Oceans Conference is yet another moment where we're able to come together and move forward on these matters. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Lacasta. Moving to just. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think the, the science is clear that we need to address primary and secondary microplastics, as well as hazardous chemicals carried by them. And in doing so, I think it is critical that we keep in mind the waste hierarchy. What that means is first, that we need to tackle the issue at source by reducing the use of primary microplastics and hazardous chemicals. Second, ensure that plastic waste is managed in an environmentally sound manner to reduce releases of secondary microplastics and hazardous substances. And third, to promote the exchange of information and control of trade in chemicals and transboundary movements of plastic waste. And I think the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions can provide important tools in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Just. And before moving uh, to Norway, who will deliver concluding remarks, uh, Franz, your takeaway message. Thanks, thanks a lot. I have three takeaway messages. Uh, the first, the same like uh, uh, Nuno Lacosta was saying, I think science remains key in all this work. Uh, science is instrumental not only to understand the problem, but also to develop uh, the right solutions. Secondly, I think it has also become very clear, plastic is a comprehensive topic, uh, um, a comprehensive topic which cannot be addressed in isolation or in a silo. So also the work on the legally binding instrument has really to build on the expertise and make use of the expertise and, and of the competences 
of uh, existing actors and institutions, such as the DRS uh, Convention, and certainly not try to uh, com com compete uh, this expertise, but, but uh, complement it and work in high, high harmony uh, with that existing um, uh, expertise. And thirdly, I think what is also absolutely clear, um, in order to address that, that big challenge, this needs strong engagement by all of us. Uh, a mandate to negotiate the legally binding instrument is not sufficient. We also need a strong and hard work by the negotiators and uh, the political will and support for a robust outcome. But this political will is not something that is a given or, or, or something that is missing, that is also, also something that can be influenced and that has to be influenced. And therefore, uh, we need again the strong science and that brings me back to the first point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. And now it's the time to conclude the event, and it's our pleasure to turn to Janik uh, Grathut, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Norway to the United Nations uh, in Geneva, to provide uh, the closing remarks of this event. And Norway has been instrumental in making uh, the international community moving on uh, what we have achieved uh, a few weeks ago uh, at the UN Environmental Assembly. And he's still very committed uh, on this topic. Uh, it has been a real pleasure to collaborate with Norway throughout our journey. Uh, over to you, Excellency. Thank you so much. And first, thank you to Anna and Jen uh, and to Geneva University and to Switzerland for, for organizing this very timely, this very timely initiative. And also thank you to the presenters uh, for your excellent presentations this afternoon. And I, uh, I have personally learned a lot and I've been inspired uh, to see that although there are gaps in, in the science still, what we do know is that we know in more than enough to act and that it's important to act. Now, already in, in 2016, uh, UNEP identified microplastics as an issue of growing concern that needs global attention. And as we've heard at UNEA 5.2 this March, the world agreed that the most effective solution to address plastic pollution uh, is an international legal binding instrument on plastic pollution. And that microplastics is a part of plastic pollution. Uh, as we also heard, microplastics can be found uh, everywhere, on the top of the highest mountains and in the Arctic sea ice, we also find it. Uh, research tells us that microplastics can be spread with the ocean currents and also by air as long range pollutants. These small uh, particles are persistent and stay in the environment for a very long time. And given the small size of the microplastic particles, prevention is key, as we've also heard uh, earlier today. Uh, in 2016, uh, the Norwegian Environment Agency uh, did the first mapping of microplastics in Norway and proposed uh, suggested means and measures to address this. And this assessment was uh, updated in 2020 as our knowledge and uh, has been um, and our uh, knowledge of impacts have grown uh, significantly in the last uh, few years. Now, uh, uh, microplastics, as microplastics may be released from a vast range of uh, different items, um, but they're, they're also part of a global value chain and we need global uh, measures to address it. Um, the, and we also have heard, and as we know, the, persistent, the persistence, the sources and the composition challenge how we regulate uh, the microplastics. Uh, uh, microplastics must be addressed across the entire life cycle uh, of plastics to prevent discharge into the environment. But the science is clear, as we've heard today, the science is clear and stronger global commitment on microplastics is, is needed. Now, uh, Norway, we believe that the new global instrument on plastic pollution must include measures targeting microplastics. And supported by the other Nordic countries, we have commissioned a Nordic report uh, on how to address microplastics in a new global agreement. This report will be written by the Norwegian Institute for Water Research and will be ready by the end of this year. The aim is to inform uh, the discussions to take place uh, in the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee. And together with Rwanda, uh, Norway has launched a high ambition coalition to ensure that we keep up the ambition for the new instrument on plastic pollution. Through this initiative, we will seek to build a broad-based coalition with members spanning all regions of the world. 
And the focus will be to deliver key messages before the INC meetings to drive ambition into the process, as well as to work intercessionally at all the technical levels to develop knowledge products and facilitate discussions in key areas to deform decision making. Now, I thank you all for the very encouraging discussion today, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue uh, as we move towards a new global instrument to end plastic pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gratrude. And it, indeed, it's now time, uh, it's really closing this event. Thank you all our panelists, and we look forward to bring you all back uh, uh, in further dialogues, uh, looking at other aspects uh, of this, um, uh, uh, when we are building this uh, uh, the pl new plastic, uh, uh, ending plastic pollution agreement. And also you, Vera, uh, in the work that will be done in Geneva concerning the science policy uh, platform that we'll be uh, setting up. So looking forward also to have uh, most of you coming back uh, on, on these particular topics. Thank you all, all the attendees who have been online, those who have uh, courage to come, come here to the, to the Environment House. It's a pleasure to, to see people again uh, in person. Bring to attention that um, there is an important session coming up also tomorrow that is taking place not here at the Environment House, but at the Graduate Institute, where we will also be discussing uh, uh, the way forward uh, this um, new uh, plas uh, ending plastic uh, pollution uh, agreement uh, with a lot of interesting uh, speakers and Switzerland is also uh, uh, on board. Um, and this week, uh, the, 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 the Working Group 3 uh, of the Intergovernment Power on Climate Change release uh, its uh, new report and we will be uh, uh, back again here in this same room at the International Environment House discussing the findings uh, of, uh, of this report. So uh, for those of you who are also interested on those topics, please join us uh, either in person either online uh, for for that event. Bring to the to attention, we were received some requests online concerning uh, sharing uh, of uh, publications and documents. Um, uh, there are a lot of resources available on the web page of this event and the link has been shared here in the in the chat and will be shared uh, uh, with whom uh, is in the room. And a lot of these uh, documents um, uh, are really available on those. There's a lot, there are a lot of resources on, uh, on, um, on, on plastic, on how to handle this plastic crisis available on these uh, web pages. So we encourage you to, to continue to visit them and the links to, to all the partners that have been engaging throughout uh, this uh, journey. So with that, uh, uh, it's uh, already uh, 46 past two, time, more than time to close the connection. Thank you all. Um, uh, for, for being with us again today.